Um, and thanks for the introduction there. So yeah, my background is I'm a computer scientist. I design um, and build lots of interesting supercomputers. Um, and I've been asked to give you a quick overview of what I think is going to be happening over the coming five to 10 years in supercomputers in ways that I think are gonna be very interesting and very important for you all. So hopefully these, these next 25 minutes or so will be, uh, be a useful setup for the whole week. So, Uh, one of the things that's going to happen over the next couple of years is we're going to get the first generation of exascale supercomputers. This is the first time we've broken the next big barrier in supercomputer performance. And something very interesting is happening. We're seeing uh, much more diversity in the next generation of supercomputers than we've had really for the last five or ten years. And I've listed five of the systems that we know are coming, five of the biggest systems that we know are coming over the next couple of years. And it's quite remarkable how different they are all from each other. So first one I've listed is, is actually in, uh, in situ right now. That's Fugaku, uh, Riken in Japan, and that's a, a CPU only machine. And it's based on Fujitsu ARM CPUs, it's A64FX. And this in itself is quite um, interesting because for a while people have been predicting that there will be no more CPU only supercomputers, uh, everyone was predicting that GPUs, graphics, gra uh, graphical processing units were taking over completely and all supercomputers in the future would, would have to use GPUs. And the first sort of supercomputer that's almost in that exascale category completely changed that. So that's something we have to keep in mind is some supercomputers might be CPU only in the future still. Uh, but the next four I've listed, all of which are going into the USA, um, they all take quite different approaches. So this, this system in Perlmutter, which has got AMD CPUs and with NVIDIA GPUs. Uh, Frontier is going to be an all AMD machine. I have AMD CPUs and AMD GPUs. And then Aurora, which is going in at Oak Ridge, that's actually an Intel machine. And it's Intel CPUs and Intel GPUs as well. And then there's El Capitan, which is another all AMD only machine. So this means one of the things you have to keep in mind is when you're working on your algorithms and your code um, during your, re your research and your PhDs, you can't develop code that's only going to run on one kind of architecture. Because if you do, you're going to seriously restrict uh, whether your code can be used on a lot of the next generation of, of machines. In code that would only run on a, on a CPU, then all of these GPU machines wouldn't work. If you wrote code that would only run on one kind of GPU, let's say you wrote in a language that only ran on an NVIDIA GPUs, that wouldn't run on four of the five machines that have been announced at Exascale. So this is something you, you really have to keep in mind um, about what's coming on, much more diversity. And this looks like this is going to carry on for the next five to 10 years um, at least. Uh, and this is not just true in the US, most of those machines were the US, but in Europe, uh, there's a great diversity in different supercomputers being considered. So the, the legend for this map, this is from Euro HPC, and it shows the different consortia that are building different kinds of supercomputers. And each one of these is building a fairly different kind of system to the rest. Some of them, again, are just CPUs. Some of them are using different GPUs to each other. Some of them are using some kind of weird and wacky accelerators. So it's not just in the, in the US where these very different approaches are being taken. Um, and so even in the, the UK where we have this tiered approach to supercomputers where our national machines, the tier ones, uh, systems like Archer, and then our tier two machines, which we call regional, but actually they're available to anyone in, in the UK. Um, in that tier two, because we have lots of different systems, we're trying lots of different approaches. We're trying, actually we're trying all of the different approaches so that we can see what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, um, and what kind of architecture might be best suited to each kind of scientific code and scientific application. I'm just gonna quickly dive into a couple of examples here in the UK. Um, one that I'm very involved with that's relevant to this uh, week for you is, is Envart, which is actually hosted at the Met Office, and the Met Office is one of the partners in Envart, so Envart's down in, in uh, Exeter, and it's the world's first production ARM-based supercomputer. So before Fugaku went into service, uh, Isambard's been running for a year or two now, uh, and it's, it, it's like it's almost like any other supercomputer, but it happens to use fast ARM cores. And ARM is the same architecture design that's inside your smartphone or inside your tablet. 
Well, almost any kind of mobile device that you have, it's likely has ARM-based uh, CPUs inside it. And ARM's now spreading out beyond mobile, beyond uh, battery-powered devices and up into servers. Um, and it's it's very exciting. It potentially offers a lot more performance per dollar, lots more performance for you, which is why we're interested in it. Um, so we built a, a real system with the Met Office um, and that's now got over 400 users trying it out. And that's been working very well. It's got things like um, the Met Office Unified model running on it, uh, Nemo, codes like that, and it works really, really well. And what's quite exciting about this is we're now seeing uh, some of the really vertical companies, so vertical companies are ones that do everything themselves from designing their own chips or in silicon all the way through to designing all the, the application and all the software on top of that. Um, the example is, is Amazon, uh, Amazon who provides cloud services and web services. Well, they've now got um, their own ARM-based server chips in Amazon Cloud, and they call them Graviton, but they're now the second generation uh, 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 Graviton 2. So with Graviton 2, you can actually hire that today. You can rent those right now. And they're really, really fast in their ARM-based ARM -based design. So ARM's going to be pretty important in the, in the future, and Fugaku sort of shows that as well. So this, this is one of the things we've been trying in the UK's um, tier two systems. Um, we've also been trying other kinds of GPU systems. So in Oxford, uh, they built a large, very dense GPU system, which uses the NVIDIA DGX1 system. Now these are mostly optimized for machine learning and AI type applications. They do run other things as well, but those sorts of uh, application optimized solutions look like they might be really relevant for certain parts of weather and climate modeling too. And these systems, they include lots of GPUs all very closely connected together with high speed networks. And they also include lots of storage um, and lots of, uh, really importantly, lots of software that's all reported to run on these systems for you. So uh, if you want to try all these different kinds of architectures out, there's probably some way you can gain access to them all. Here in the UK, through the tier two, you can try most architectures you might be interested in. I've got a link at the bottom here to where you can find um, the tier twos and the tier one information in the UK, but through Euro HPC, and if you have links outside of that in, in the US or Japan, again, you should be able to get access to most of these different kinds of technology uh, and give them a try. Now, there is more than just CPUs and GPUs, and something else exciting that's happening is certain hardware vendors are starting to develop very different kinds of processes. And I think this is another very important trend which you need to keep an eye on because these are growing very rapidly and probably you should find exploiting this to your benefit. And if you can, it might give you an advantage. It might make something possible that just wasn't possible before. So um, I've mentioned a couple of companies here, uh, one of which is Google. Google's actually developing their own hardware for doing uh, AI and machine learning. They call it the TensorFlow Processing Unit, or TPU. But there are other companies. I mentioned one here called GraphCore. That's actually based in the UK. Um, Intel has one called Nirvana. And there's, there's actually dozens of, of companies from big to small all looking to see if optimizing hardware specifically for AI and machine learning like algorithms um, is a good approach. Now, for the Google approach, they're now onto their fourth generation of this kind of hardware. So this is something they're very interested in the one you can rent right now is the is the third generation v3 um, they've got 420 teraflops uh, in one blade one server and you can rent this for just over two dollars an hour so this is pretty impressive and then the picture on the right is um, google building a big pod and a whole bunch of these blades racked together you can have over 100 petaflops so that if, if that was 100 petaflops of, of limpack that would be up there in the top you know, to top three position in, um, in, in the top 500 lists. So this is an amazing sort of performance, lots of very fast memory, uh, really fast network all joining it together, but designed and optimized more specifically for artificial intelligence and machine learning type, type workloads. And the next generation, which basically Google has in the lab and which will be released quite soon, is a supposed to improve performance by almost another three times again on top of that. So these kinds of architectures are well worth um, looking into uh, a slightly different approach is GraphCore, which I mentioned is actually based here in the UK. Or oh, HBM, by the way, is high bandwidth memory. It's a special kind of memory which has a very wide interface. 
um, you can have a terabyte a second or more of high bandwidth memory bandwidth onto one socket. Um, Fugaku uses that, uh, GPUs are now using that. Um, CPUs aren't using it yet other than Fugaku, but it's going to become more, more common. Grokos technology is actually pretty exciting. They've got four of these processes, which they call Colossus, in this one new box, and that will give you a petaflop of what they call AI compute. It's basically 16-bit floating point. So the floating point numbers that you manipulate in your code um, in high-performance computing, that's traditionally 64-bit floating point or double precision. Um, in recent times, we're looking to see if you can exploit um, single precision, which is 32-bit floating point. Those are all standard. Uh, but more recently, if you're doing um, AI or machine learning type codes, often 16-bit floating point is good enough. Actually, will give you the right answers. Um, there is a standard for 16-bit floating point in IEEE, so this is standard as well now. Um, and the nice thing about this, if it will work for you, is generally you can run it faster. So maybe you can do two or four times as many of these smaller floating point operations as a bigger one. It takes up less space. Uh, you can get four of them in the same space as a, of a 64-bit one. Um, and moving them around, and often it's the moving of data around the network or central memory, that bandwidth is often your limiting factor. So obviously, if, if you can get four 16-bit floating point numbers in the same space as one double precision floating point number, that's a big win too. So this reduced precision, we often call it, um, is something that also is very interesting. And if you can get away with 32-bit or even 16-bit floating point, often it can be a big win. So this graph core Colossus um, IPU takes advantage of this reduced precision to get to a petaflop using just four processors in one server. That is pretty impressive. Um, it's about this second generation, which is just coming out. It's about seven to nine times faster than graph core's first generation. And it's the most sophisticated chip ever developed, most complicated single chip, nearly 60 billion transistors, which is just a mind boggling number all packed onto one fairly large chip, 823 millimeters squared. It's actually the largest chip that's ever been built. And it's designed for this AI and machine learning space because it's a rapidly growing area. There's lots of money in it. And that's why it's very interesting to look at this space and see if you can take advantage of it. Um, yes, and so whilst some of this precision is slightly non-standard, um, their single precision, for example, is completely standard IEEE 754. So if you had an algorithm that ran on that, which you could cross to the graph core IPU, um, it might be interesting and relevant to you. I actually have a really good master student porting a, a lattice bolt code to this at the moment, and it's going going pretty fast, actually slightly faster than a, than a GPU. So it might be worth taking a look at something like this. And of course, um, you don't just have one blade of this, you tend to build giant systems from these from these IPUs and the latest graph core um, products that you build up to 64,000 of them in one system, all with its own special kind of interconnect, all with software that will run across the whole thing. So you, that's, that's literally exaflops of, of compute all in one big system. So I think there's some very exciting things in this area of AI and machine learning from lots of different vendors that it's well worth keeping your eye on and seeing if you can exploit what you're doing. Now, because of all of these things I've been talking about, these different kinds of architectures that are hugely parallel, they raise a number of issues for um, software development. And this is something I wanted to leave you all thinking about with this week. The first is obviously massive parallelism. So Fugaku is, is over 7 million cores. So you've already got you know, orders of tens of millions of ways parallelism just to think about cores. But they're also data parallel processes. They have two 512 bit wide vectors that's basically 32 single precision numbers can be processed in parallel in each one of 7.6 million cores so that's tens of millions hundreds of millions of ways of parallelism you have to exploit all at once to be able to use all of Vigaku on one problem at once so this is massive parallelism way beyond anything we've had to deal with so far second big challenge is now what we call heterogeneity you have different kinds of processes that you need to be able to exploit all at once so your system might have cpus and gpus in it those might be from different vendors so there's intel amd nvidia fujitsu marvel develops the arm chips inside isambard 
Um, IBM has some really great power processes. They just announced Power 10 as the next generation. Now, Amazon's designing um, their own server chips as well, and lots and lots more. Uh, and as well as CPUs and GPUs, there are more non-traditional architectures starting to become really important. We mentioned the graph core, um, intelligent processing units, their IPUs, but also these Google um, uh, processors we've been talking about. There are things like vector engines. NEC does some really interesting vector engines that have lots and lots of performance. And there are other things, uh, field programmable gate arrays or FPGAs, and new things coming out all of the time. So uh, that coupled with complicated memory hierarchies where you've got on-chip caches, you've got high bandwidth memories, you've got bigger, slower DRAMs, and you've got storage class memories. Dealing with all of these at once in your in your codes is becoming really, really challenging. There are lots of big um, issues that are raised um, that you're going to have to think about over your coming weeks, months, and, and years. In the US, within the Exascale Computing Project, they have lots of software projects focused on trying to deal with all of these issues. Two of them are focused on the big uh, message passing libraries, and they want to get those running efficiently at very large scale at the Exascale, MPitch and OpenMPI. Uh, another common approach is to use task level parallelism. This is one way we think we have to scale codes out onto much bigger systems while keeping them resilient to failures and to um, different parts of the system possibly running at different speeds. And that's Legion Parsec. Uh, there's a, an approach called partition global address space. It lets you write a big, it's almost like writing one big open MP program, like a big shared memory program across the whole system, even though it's actually distributed memory. And that's looking at UPC++ and GasNet. There's a couple of projects within uh, a parallel C++ task. And Cocos and Raj are two sort of parallel C++ approaches being explored in the US. Um, and then there are a couple of projects looking at low level or no parallel thread-like parallelism. And that's within Argo and, and Sikkim. So the US has a huge amount of effort going into how to tackle this software problem caused by all this amazing hardware that's going on. Now, from all of that, uh, I've been working in this space for a long time. I've got some advice, things I, I'd say to keep in mind while you're you're doing your research in the future. So here's some do's and don'ts from me. And one of the things is you really work hard to expose maximum parallelism at all the levels of your code. And so you're targeting within the hardware, there's data parallelism, there's loop parallelism, there's thread parallelism, task, core, socket, node, if you do multiple sockets within a node, and system level parallelism. There's lots and lots of different levels. So you really need to work hard to expose maximum parallelism. You basically want nothing left that's serial within your code. Otherwise, it's just not going to scale on these really large systems. Another thing is, is the plan for the long term. So things keep changing. Um, flops are essentially free now. You're doing an operation uh, is actually really cheap. And the expensive thing, the thing that takes time, is moving data around and storing it somewhere. That's the thing that takes a long time. So it might mean that in the future, it's going to be cheaper and quicker to recompute something than to pre-compute it and store it somewhere and then have to fetch that data from a big table in memory. It might be cheap just to recompute it. Even if it takes quite a few floating point operations, they'll be so quick that actually it's going to be quicker than going and fetching that data from somewhere over the network or from storage. So this is something to keep in mind. And this, these ratios are changing over time. So keep that plan for the long term, plan for the kinds of systems and the kind of ratios of compute to bandwidth and latency that you'll have in the future rather than what we've had in the past. Another thing is the degree of parallelism we you now need to consider. You know, 10 to the 9 degrees of parallelism or more in the future. In the past, you know, if you had thousands of degrees, and that was probably plenty. So this is really, really ballooning. Another piece of advice is stick to standard parallel programming languages and frameworks. All of that heterogeneity, if you want your code to run on all of those different machines, it's only going to be standards that work across all of those different machines. So things like MPI, um, Sickle, which is a, an emerging uh, C++, parallel C++ standard. Intel has their own flavor of that called 1API, but it's basically Sickle. OpenMP, those are open standards that generally will run across all of those different machines I've been talking about. Um, there's an emerging new language called Julia, which has also been widely supported if you want to try new. Um, another thing you're going to be talking a lot about this week is domain-specific languages. And those are a really good way of 
of isolating the science, so the way you express the problem that you're trying to solve, from the parallel code that gets generated for you. And the parallel code that gets generated could be in any language for any different architecture, and that shouldn't change what you've written in the domain-specific language on the front end. So actually, DSLs are going to be a really good way of trying to tackle this big problem of lots of diversity in, in high-performance computing. I've only really got one don't that I would want to point out, which is don't get hooked on a vendor proprietary pro programming language. Um, and this will be true of any vendor. This is not specific to any one vendor. The main one that comes up all the time, because they've been very uh, vociferous in promoting um, their own languages in NVIDIA. So CUDA and OpenACC, they only run on NVIDIA hardware, or they only run well on NVIDIA hardware. That's both CUDA and OpenACC. If you write a load of amazing code and it will only run in CUDA, then it's not going to run well on an AMD GPU or an NVIDIA GPU, or sorry, or an Intel GPU or a CPU from anyone else. So you really should avoid those. There are usually good alternatives that will run everywhere else. So just make sure you don't get locked in um, to any one vendor, whoever it is, not just NVIDIA. Pick on them here, um, but it's not just them. Um, so some key takeaways as we, we come to the end, things that I want you to keep in mind during your, your entire research career, if you like. Um, one is that we've got a lot more parallelism coming. So you need to find more and more parallelism in your problem, in your, in your code. Um, there's increased heterogeneity of CPU plus something else, CPU plus a GPU or a CPU plus an AI processor or a CPU plus who knows what, an FPGA or something. Uh, it's likely that MPI plus some other language is going to be one of the most common programming approaches. It could be MPI plus OpenMP, MPI plus Sickle or some other parallel C++. That's very likely to be a, a very common approach. Uh, but also do domain specific languages, especially in your space in weather and climate, are really going to be important approaches. So make sure you understand those and, and you're very involved in that space. Uh, if you're writing a code from scratch, then there are a few new things which actually look quite promising. Uh, Julia is quite an interesting language. There has been a project already porting one of the codes from the climate weather space to Julia, and it seems to work quite well. So that's something else to look at. And I hope this hasn't put you off in, in sounding sort of too scary, because actually, in some ways, this is one of the most exciting times to be developing software. You have lots of interesting new problems to solve, you have lots of interesting new hardware that's running faster than ever before. There are things you're going to be able to do now that just were not feasible before. So that's a great time to be involved in, in doing some of these things. So hopefully anyway, that's got you excited about what's coming up this week. Uh, on the last slide, I'm just going to leave you with, and there's my email address if you'd like to get in touch. Um, I'm on Twitter. I generally only use Twitter for um, HPC related stuff, so you can follow me there if, you, if you're interested. And then the, the link to my group's web page there. If you want to find some of the papers behind some of the things I've been talking about, if you type my name into Google Scholar, you'll generally find uh, most of those things. And that's everything I had. So thank you very much. I'll come back to the chat and I'll try and answer any questions that come up come up while I've been talking over the next 10 minutes or so. Um, but I wish you a very interesting day today and for the rest of the week enjoy your summer school thank you simon, thank you, simon. for a wonderful, wonderful introduction uh, we do have some okay that's much better thank you. that's much better thank you. it's not still echoing so then if we could uh oh it's gone thank you brilliant um so we do have uh, one one we have time we have one question simon but um if, if you're okay to ask that. Sure. So, so, so do, do you actually ask um, climate and NWP? I'm sorry, I, I lost your audio. Can you repeat the question? Sorry, Simon, can you hear me now? Yes, much better. Um, yeah, so it was a, a question from Julian. He, he asked um, if you could say which climate code or NW code was ported to Julia or which section. Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head. I will look it up now and I'll post it into the chat. 
That's great. That's Thank, great. You. Thank you. Uh, actually, I, I, I have one question, if that's okay. Now I've got you. Don't tend to sure. don't tend to have a chance to ask you questions. What what um what do you think about um the fact about heterogeneous computing? Do do you do you see all these different um, flavors of processor potentially going onto one chip, or do you think they're going to stay separate? What, what do you think about that? So that's a really good question, and actually, I, th I think what's going to happen is. Um, we're going to see in the future, I think, multiple approaches lasting for the long term. So I think the Figaku style approach, where you have many, many CPU cores all on one chip, each with very wide vectors, I think, I think you'll see second and third generations of that approach because it seems to work very well. So I think we will see that, and we call that, say, a homogeneous approach. Then in terms of the, the heterogeneous approaches, which is where you'd have a CPU and a GPU, say, Right now, while those are separate chips, so they have to sit next to each other, maybe with a, a, a slower bus between them, which slows everything down. In the future, I think it's very likely we'll see those integrated onto one chip, or possibly even more likely they'll be within one package, so that it will look like one chip, but inside that chip, if you would take the top off, there'd be multiple bits of silicon all kind of glued down next to each other, or in some cases actually even sandwiched together in what we call 3D packaging. Um, and that gives you some benefits in terms of they're physically much closer and, and there'd be a lot potential for a lot higher bandwidth and a lot, lot lower latency between the CPUs and the GPUs once they're packaged that closely together. And, and uh, I think all the main vendors are, are in a position to do that kind of thing. So Intel can do that, AMD can do that, NVIDIA, NVIDIA can do that. NVIDIA already does that, just not in high performance computing. If you buy an embedded NVIDIA chip to go in, say, a car. So there's lots of NVIDIA chips going into cars now. There are already CPUs and GPUs in one chip, um, and they're actually ARM cores. So NVIDIA actually already does their own ARM cores, which are embedded with their GPUs. So I think we're very likely to see in the future um, CPUs and GPUs all integrated very closely together to look like they're one big chip. Brilliant. Thank, thank you very much. I, th I think. Um, I think we'll move on now. Um, you, you've made great time. Thank, thank you. But I, I do see there are still questions coming in. So, as you said, if, 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 if you can answer those, answer those as, uh, uh, in the chat, in the chat I'll, I'll do that. I'll, I'll take a few minutes to try and answer questions in the chat. But thank you. Thanks, Simon.